These are the men who served in the 84th Infantry Division during the final months of World War II. First committed to action on the Siegfried Line in November 1944, they were quickly caught up in the Battle of the Bulge and the series of conclusive engagements that followed. This is their story. By the beginning of November 1944, the defeat of Germany appeared imminent. To the east, Russian armies had pushed their way through Poland and the Balkans. To the south, Anglo-American forces were moving relentlessly up the Italian peninsula. To the west, Allied armies, having advanced to France and the Low Countries, now gathered along the borders of Western Germany. Altogether, we were on the Siegfried Line for about three weeks, and uh, my memories of that uh, are pretty much blurred. It was mostly mud and cabbages, and every now and then, uh, we did have a, a slight move forward, but for the most part, we were uh, just in the foxholes, usually filled with water. American soldiers, on the whole, I believe, find it very difficult to hate. We spoke of the Germans and thought of the Germans as our enemy, but there was no such thing as violent hatred. The non-commissioned officer in the American army is unique. He has to be the leader of his men, but many of the men under him can also be leaders. One of the chief problems that faces any replacement officer is measuring up to the opinions the men had of the officers that uh, commanded them before. And after we got all the battalions settled down in their foxholes for the night, I dug out a pair of blue silk pajamas that my wife had insisted that I put in my bedroll and put them on and crawled in my bedroll to sleep for the night. Of course, this news spread around over the battalion immediately, and my purpose was achieved because all of the men felt that if the old man had gotten in his silk pajamas and gone to bed, that certainly there was no trouble or they weren't in great danger, so they relaxed and were able to get a good night's rest. These are the men who served in the 84th Infantry Division a division that distinguished itself in a series of critical engagements during World War II. Thus, this story could be the story of any infantry division where the uncommon virtues of courage, endurance, and self-sacrifice became the commonplace. Good old M1 rifle. Semi-automatic, breech-loaded. Seems a lot heavier than it did 20 years ago. My name is John Shaw. I was with the 84th Infantry Division as a buck private during World War II. I was one of these uh, ASTP boys, 3,000 of us shipped down to the 84th Division in April before we went overseas in 1944. And we were trained hard and sent overseas in September and were in England for a while and then we caught the Red Ball Express. And then before we knew it, we were right on the edge of the line, ready to go into combat. And we were all of us uh, uh, kind of wondering what things were going to be like. We could see the, uh, the shells going off, we could hear them. And we were all sort of nervous, but I don't think anyone was really fully conscious and aware of what was going to happen. The men of the 84th Division had managed to penetrate the enemy lines a few hundred yards east of the Dutch frontier. But the Siegfried Line barred the way to further advance. This fortified zone of tank traps, gun emplacements, and pillboxes had become a shield behind which weary German troops now assembled. General Siegfried Westphal Chief of Staff to Field Marshal von Rundstedt had this to say of the situation. 
Für die deutsche Führung im Westen war es lebenswichtig. It was essential for the German high command in the West to gain time in order to re-equip the West fortifications called Siegfried Line for defense purposes. We had to make every effort, therefore, to see to it that our troops could maintain this position as long as possible. Westlich dieser Siegfried Linie also noch in Belgien und Luxemburg behaupten konnten. The West fortifications had no weapons. The wire entanglements had been dismantled, and even some of the keys to unlock the rusty dugouts were missing. The defensive value of these constructions was so minimal that the soldiers preferred to live in a trench under the open sky rather than have the concrete ceiling collapse over their heads. We reported this to Hitler, who flew into a rage and retorted, the whole world trembles in fear of this phenomenal achievement of German technology. The 84th Division's immediate mission, part of a general offensive, was to crack the Siegfried Line at the town of Geilenkirchen and then establish beachheads on the nearby Rohr River. Beyond lay the main objective, the Rhine. I'm Lieutenant General Lewis W. Truman. During World War II, I was a Colonel, Chief of Staff of the 84th Infantry Division, and Chief of Staff to Alexander R. Bowling, the Commanding General of the 84th Division. The intelligence which we received was of the very best. The individuals clear down to the squad level uh, were indoctrinated, instructed exactly what their jobs were to be. There is no question but that we were very, had very much confidence that we'd be able to carry out this mission. I know also that the regiments, the battalions, the companies, and the platoons and squads had that same feeling of confidence. The 84th Division would be supported by the British on the left and the American 2nd Armored and 102nd Infantry on the right. Facing them were several Volksgrenadier divisions and a number of crack panzer units. At precisely five minutes to seven on the morning of November 18th, an artillery barrage signaled that the attack had commenced. Geilenkirchen uh, was about three miles away from where we were, and uh, so happened that our uh, regiment was leading the attack, and I uh, happened to be in the first platoon of the first company, and I happened to be in the first squad of the first platoon, and so happened that I was the first scout. So uh, I was first. And uh, we came through a little woods and out onto a sport plot, so we shot across this uh, clearing and into the outskirts of the town. And there was a trench there, and we walked up the trench, uh, all of us feeling pretty uh, happy at this point and, and uh, pretty proud of ourselves for having gotten that far. And we, it seemed to me the whole company was strung out into one big line. And uh, all of a sudden, a German in a window three blocks away opened up on our, our column in this trench with a machine gun. And of course, we all hit the dirt. And we just waited there for uh, somebody to do something. Finally, a, a British tank uh, lumbered up the street, uh, off to our side, and, and fired two shells right into that window. And so that was the end of that. I'm Richard K. Hawkins. I was a first lieutenant with A Company 334th Infantry of the 84th Infantry Division. It was necessary for complete cooperation between various branches 
of the army. And since it was necessary for the infantrymen to attack on foot, seize the ground and hold it, it was also necessary for artillery to neutralize these positions before the infantrymen jumped off. It was a wonderful show of cooperation between these different branches. We got through Geilenkirchen and we started on the road that we thought was taking us right to Berlin. We felt great and we were pretty excited about being in the war. And after we'd gone about 500 yards up the road, the 88 started coming in. Like fools, we ran into a little woods and all of us tried our best to uh, uh, dig into the ground. We used our hands and just tried to claw the dirt, trying to dig in. In the meantime, these shells were coming into the trees and bursting all around us and uh, our friends were being hit and were screaming for medics. This lasted at a uh, scene for about half an hour. I suppose it lasted about five minutes. I am Fritz Kramer. I was with the 84th Division as a rather elderly soldier from my 35th to my 37th year. I do remember very clearly now the feelings we had, like all men who go into battle for the very first time. We were uncertain. We were very unsure of ourselves. We knew very well that combat was very different from training. And I remember this excitement. And I may frankly say, for all soldiers who may come after us, we were also full of fear. Not necessarily fear of the enemy, but fear of our own making it or not making it. How would we stand up? I think our general told us later that he had been praying in those hours when he committed the men he had trained for the first time for combat. I know now, and we all know now, that the battle went well and that our one regiment that was attached to combat proven British forces did well, found the praise of the British and we immediately gained an extraordinary increase in self-confidence. We had met the enemy and while we certainly hadn't performed any great heroics, we felt our self-confidence greatly increased. I'm Donald Phelps. I was a sergeant in the 333rd Infantry of the 84th Division. We found that we could sneak up to patrol boxes easily at night and uh, hit and run. The biggest problem in this type of action was that the regular emplacements of the German army in the patrol boxes had everything so zeroed in that uh, all major road intersections were under constant interdicting fire. By the 21st of November, the Siegfried line had been dented. The objectives in and around Geilenkirchen had been taken. The 84th now headed for the Rohr River, a few miles distant. General Bowling picked the village of Lenick as the ideal location for the planned river crossing. Before our actual combat experience, we always thought that engineers were people who came along after we passed through and repaired bridges and so forth. actually had engineer squads with each rifle platoon whose function was to place explosive charges in pillbox and braziers. And uh, this helped a great deal in overcoming this resistance. In the murderous frontal attack that followed, several discoveries were made. 
All sectors of the German Western Front had strict orders to relinquish as little German territory as possible. Every inch of ground was to be defended tenaciously. The uncertainty concerning the Allied situation posed an especially conspicuous problem. One never knows what the enemy has up his sleeve. One does not know for certain how strong he is. One does not know about his disposition. Many things can only be guessed. But there are certain impressions one does acquire. We were of the opinion that the American unit, excellently equipped and under good leadership, was headed for ultimate success, confident of victory. Besides, the command was prudent, advancing step by step, justly trying to avoid bloodshed wherever possible. By the end of November, the German defenses west of the Ruhr had been either captured or neutralized by men of the 84th Division. On December 2nd, the coveted prize of Lenick fell to the neighboring 102nd Division. To sum up the actions of the 84th Division, in the Guilin Kirchen area, in the Siegfried Line. It had reduced or captured eight strong points or villages. It had captured or destroyed over 112 bunkers. It had captured 28 officers and over 1,500 enlisted men. It had engaged 15 different kinds of German units to include SS troops and Panzer units. And we might say, as an overall sum up, every mission had been accomplished. While the Allies made preparations for the crossing of the Ruhr, a major offensive was about to be launched by the combined German forces. The offensive, codenamed Watch on the Rhine, would be more generally known as the Battle of the Bulge. It was Hitler's last opportunity to achieve the initiative on the Western Front, and at least 28 divisions would be engaged in this desperate gamble. that I am on this afternoon is representative of those around Marsh, Belgium that are now being farmed again. In December of 1944, much in contrast, these fields were not being uh, farmed. There were streams of, of refugees all through the area, again moving out with the, because the intelligence was, or their rumors were, that the Germans again were coming into the town of Marsh. About 9 o'clock on the morning of the 20th of December, General Bowling, along with a couple of staff officers, an aide and four MPs, went to Verviers, Belgium, where the First Army headquarters was. He asked what the enemy information was, and the only thing they could tell him was that it was fluid. Also, he asked for what the mission of the division would be in the marsh area. He was told that there the division should go into an assembly area.
As the front bows further westward, the principal road centers of La Rouche and saint vie Belgium, fell to the Germans. Bastogne was encircled and its capitulation seemed certain. Unless the town of Marsh, Belgium, remained in Allied hands, it seemed probable that the Germans could take the River Meuse and sweep onto Paris. The 84th Division was ordered to withdraw from its positions on the Rohr and take up a defensive line along the marsh houghton Road. It was at this time that we got sudden orders to move. We were loaded into the Army trucks and we started moving back. We heard all kinds of rumors. We heard the Germans had broken through. We heard there was a big offensive. Everything was confused, but all we knew, we were on the road and moving again. Of course, it had only been a month before that we'd moved up by truck, so we were kind of used to it. But this was a night move, in the dark, around the back corners, and orders were changed constantly. We never knew from one minute to the next what was going on. On our way back, we ran into trailers bringing up assault boats to cross rivers with. They apparently were for us, but we weren't going to be there to be with them. We finally found that at the end of this truck route, which was very circuitous, we ended up in the town of Marsh in Belgium. And although our orders were a little unclear, we were told to hold the town at all costs. We first had our first snow at this point, and digging foxholes in icy ground was a little difficult. But we kept always on the move. And our company was seen to be ending up as division reserve. So we were sent here and there on little jobs and filling up the gaps and trying to get the situation under control. We spent our first night in Belgium uh, billeted in a huge stone barn with hay and big fat cows and horses chomping around us and uh, we were excited to be where once again there was some life. We went down the road and had a nice chicken dinner with some eggs and milk, uh, food that we hadn't had it seemed like weeks and weeks. And uh, there seemed to be no nervousness about uh, Germans until later on that night when we spotted uh, way across the valley a, a column of, uh, of uh, tanks going up the road and somebody pointed out that those were German tanks and we had been told we were miles and miles behind the front. And that's when we realized that there was a good deal of confusion uh, in the general picture in Belgium. Well, after that, uh, we went by truck to a little town called Wanlan and uh, met a, a very lovely Belgian woman in a, a French uh, or a Belgian chateau uh, who had two daughters and she was just getting them into the car to drive them to Brussels. She said they had a, an appointment with the oculist and it was only later that we realized she was fleeing as fast as she could and she knew that the situation was very bad and uh, later on that night we had our first encounter with some uh, German tanks which came along and fired at us and we fired back and uh, they went on uh, back the road that they'd come from but we realized we were uh, in, in what they call a fluid situation with uh, nobody quite certain where the front lines were, uh, least of all us. I'm Major General Bill Sutton, and I was a battalion commander in General Bowling's 84th Rail Splitter Division during World War II. I arrived at the rear CP of the 84th Division in Holland on the 20th of December, 1944, and moved down with the division to Marsh, Belgium, on the 22nd of December. To say that the situation was fluid is putting it lightly. In Marsh, Belgium, uh, every other house was occupied by Germans. And there was uh, firing up and down the streets. The 334th Infantry and organized positions along the front edge of the Marsh Houghton Ridge. And I can remember that the foxholes were sometimes 150 yards apart. And they'd been dug in frozen ground, sometimes with the aid of explosives. The position was uh, considerably overextended, and uh, various pockets of uh, German 
tanks and infantry uh, existed all up and down the line. And uh, during the day, the Germans had infiltrated tanks and infantry into a wooded area back of the front lines and in front of the reserve elements. And they were discovered quite by accident by a small unit going up to reinforce a, uh, an attack that took the wrong road and ran into this pocket of uh, German tanks and infantry. And they backed off and reported this. The 84th Division artillery fired on this pocket, which was pretty well defined, and they knocked out all of these tanks and killed several hundred Germans. When the artillery had finished firing, one battalion, I remember the 326, had only six rounds of ammunition left. We had other ammunition on the way, but no one knew exactly when it would get there, and it was a rather touch-and-go situation. There are many things imprinted on my mind that will make me always remember the kind of stuff our American soldiers were made of. One incident in particular occurred in the Ardennes during the Battle of the Bows. We were advancing toward Bale, Belgium, and uh, a mortar shell came in and wounded several men right close around me. There was one man that was almost in arm's reach of me, and I could see that he was hit badly with uh, the back of his head uh, practically bone off, and he was in a state of shock. I tried to comfort the man, prop his head up until the medic could reach him, and all this time, and I shall never forget this, this man was trying to apologize for me for being hit and sorry, almost crying, because he would not get to carry on with the battalion and continue the fight. The marsh Houghton line, situated as it was at the extreme tip of the bulge, received the full weight of the German attack. Chance had placed the fate of this offensive in the hands of an American infantry division. For the men of the 84th, there was no question as to what I found going. the safest place to be in any attack was in the assault wave, because we were upon the enemy before he knew we were coming. We escaped much of a small arms fire, and in addition, we didn't get the retaliation from his artillery that the waves following us got. And in this town, uh, as we did on all of our objectives, each company commander and separate uh, platoon that was ordered to take a certain position uh, followed the practice of writing a message on an egg, on a fresh egg, uh, that they had taken their objective and what time, and sent this by messenger to the battalion sergeant major at battalion headquarters. And this is where we got our fresh eggs as we crossed Germany. As we were leaving for the attack that night, the first sergeant said, take it easy and don't get hurt. I said, sure, I won't, but I knew right then that I was going to get it, and a half an hour later I did. We had been fighting then for 10 weeks, and we brought back a spirit of feeling of confidence, not only in the staff, but also in the, the regiments, battalions, and even com uh, companies, which really uh, put us in good stead for the future. December 1944. In a last effort to regain the military initiative, Hitler had ordered a major counteroffensive in the Ardennes. As fog and sleet grounded all Allied planes, German infantry and panzer units swept 50 miles into Belgium, recapturing the key road junction of saint and Laurens, and surrounding the defenders of Bastogne. A major part of the German attack was turned against the town of Marsh, Belgium, the key to the River Meuse, beyond which lay Paris, only recently liberated, and Antwerp, the Allies' chief supply port. The 4th Infantry Division had hurriedly left the Siegfried Line and had taken up defensive positions along the Marsh Houghton Road. Only by the most heroic resistance would the Allies be able to hold in the flanks of the Nazi salient 
and keep the enemy line from bulging further westward. I'm Richard K. Hawkins. I was a first lieutenant with A Company 334th Infantry of the 84th Infantry Division. We were spread over an extremely wide frontage. Our rifle company actually covered close to a mile in, in uh, width with foxholes of two men each, roughly about 100 yards apart. This is perhaps four to five times the usual amount of frontage that a rifle company will cover in a defensive situation. There were several times when our forces were attacked by great numbers of tanks. In one instance, uh, near the village of Verden, approximately 200 inf enemy infantry and nine Tiger tanks attacked us and actually overran our position. This was one of the few times in which it became necessary for me to call down artillery fire on our own position. Enemy casualties during the Battle of the Bulge were much higher than ours due to the fact that primarily they were expending themselves against uh, defensive position, and this happens in any battle. However, they had far overextended their supply lines, and, and many of the troops that we captured had not had any food for some time. And I would say that their casualties outnumbered ours by at least three to one. This stately chateau, situated at the edge of the village of Verden, is the property of a Polish baron. During the December fighting, it became a house of horrors, as it was methodically disfigured by some of the bitterest hand-to-hand -hand fighting of the war. A member of the family recalls. My name is Elizabeth de Radisky, and I spent many days in the castle at Verden. We witnessed the whole battle, and I was with my father and a few people from the village, and some friends who had come here to find shelter. We spent five days and five nights in the cellar of the castle. First came the Germans, then Americans. Generally, we could not tell who was in the castle, Although we did notice that the Americans wore rubber soles, they walked softly, whereas the Germans, who wore metal tips, were very noisy. Our food consisted of bread, some butter and ham. The real problem was to get water. We had to walk through corridors where Germans and Americans were often fighting in order to reach the faucet where we could get the water. Sometimes we would meet Americans, sometimes Germans. A week after the Ardennes offensive had begun, the weather suddenly cleared. Allied air reconnaissance and bombardment was now possible. Although Allied air superiority was complete, the ground fighting remained intense throughout the bulge. The turning point in the Battle of the Marsh came on December 26th. I'm Donald Phelps, I was a sergeant in the 333rd Infantry of the 84th Division. I was leading the company column on the left-hand side of the road, and the company commander was leading on the right-hand side. 
As we broke over the top of the hill, it became apparent that there were some armored vehicles ahead of us. I knew that we needed something to really go after vehicles of this type with, and that the bazooka, which was being carried by another man farther back in the first platoon, uh, did not come up as fast as I'd like. I found the bazooka back in the platoon behind me, but found the ammunition was across the road. I loaded once, got up real close, and fired. And I was very gratified that the bazooka worked properly and I made a good hit. I'd never fired one before. I made two or three back trips back to the ammunition supply and up and fired again. All of a sudden, somebody had spotted that we needed uh, some help in that area and some of our artillery fired. I was threatened to throw across my hand and arm and I, as it came, I felt it burn and I heard it bounce off the end of the bazooka. I realized I'd been hit, but it didn't seem too serious. One of the men near me also realized I'd been hit, and he came over to see if he'd give me aid. We succeeded in putting a tourniquet around my arm by using my belt, but then I started back down the road. After we got back to a couple of platoons, actually was such that I could stand up and walk down the road, and all I could think of was, Merry Christmas, boys. My name is John Shaw. I fought as a buck private with the 84th Infantry Division during World War II. This excruciatingly cold night I remember trying to get a drink from my canteen, which was frozen solid. And so we started out through the woods, uh, crouching and uh, moving forward. And uh, then uh, someone yelled fire and, uh, and shout. And so we started firing and shouting. And the traces went through the woods and uh, we moved on uh, in a kind of hysterical way, getting more and more uh, excited as we moved forward and, and heard more noise and, and were firing. We went uh, perhaps 20 feet or 25 feet and all of a sudden there was that uh, terrible noise that a person hates to hear, the little pop of a flare. And it was a German flare and it lit up the whole woods. And there we were and there they were. The Germans then opened up with machine gun fire in 88, and, and uh, I know I had a, a kind of sinking feeling that this was it. I, uh, this was the first real fighting that, that uh, our company had been in, uh, where we were playing with the big boys, and we knew that uh, this was for keeps, and, and all of us were, were terrified. Uh, these machine gun bullets were firing a few feet off the ground and uh, then occasionally uh, as they would rake up and down this line of uh, all through the woods, uh, occasionally they would dip down and then you'd hear somebody screaming from that section where they dipped down and they sprayed us uh, like uh, just as if they had a garden hose. They sprayed and sprayed and then the uh, uh, more flares went up and the tanks opened up directly again with uh, 88 fire. And the man on my right, uh, on the other side, who was uh, equally close, was uh, was wounded uh, very seriously. His kneecap was blown off, and uh, the the cries and shrieks of, of wounded really went up then. 
And I, uh, I turned to the man on uh, my right and uh, put a tourniquet on his leg. My name is Major General Bill Sutton, and I was a battalion commander in the 84th Division in World War II. It was critically important for the 84th Division to hold the Marsh Hutton Ridge and stop the attack. And only by the determination of the officers and men of the 84th Division and the expert leadership of General Bowling, the division commander, were they able to do this. After the German advance was stopped in the last few days of December, the Germans were noticed to be digging in in front of the position, which indicated they did not intend to continue attacking. The bulge would bulge no further. Hitler had again misjudged the capacity of the American soldier. My name is Karl Theodor Siegfried Westphal. My last rank in the German army was that of a general of the cavalry. From the beginning of September 1944 until May 1945, I was commander of the general staff of Commander-in-Chief West. Hitler had a vast and extensive tactical military knowledge, but he was a fanatic. Fanatics are known for their disability to keep a cool head and weigh their thoughts carefully. This, however, is an absolute necessity for the strategist. At the same time, Hitler was not inclined to consider the enemy capable of accurate and fast action. He was and remained a military dilettante. That is a voraussetzung for the strategy. Ebenso war er nicht geneigt dem Gegner richtiges und schnelles Handeln zuzugehen. Daran ist er gescheitert. Er war und blieb ein militärischer Dilettant. The cost to Germany of Hitler's miscalculations would be staggering. More than a quarter of a million men dead, wounded or captured. At least 1,400 tanks and guns destroyed or abandoned. Slowly and painfully, the remnants of the once proud Wehrmacht retreated behind their shattered western defenses. It was the beginning of the end. By the 3rd of February, the 84th Division had again moved back to their positions on the Siegfried Line. Their watery objectives lay before them. The Ruhr, the Rhine, and the Elbe. Lieutenant General Louis W. Truman. During World War II, I was a Colonel, Chief of Staff of the 84th Infantry Division, and Chief of Staff for Alexander R. Bowling, who was the Commanding General of the 84th Infantry Division. The Ruhr River crossing was one of the most thoroughly rehearsed river crossings of any unit in the European theater. The original crossing date was to be 10 February, but it was postponed because the Germans had flooded uh, the area. So we then had about two more weeks in which to work out all the details very thoroughly and to rehearse all the units for the overall operation. It's amazing that we ever got across the Ruhr River considering the confusion that takes place during the preparations for the attack. If you can imagine us being pitch dark uh, with a narrow road with uh, huge trucks with uh, fountains for the assault bridges to come later along one side of the road and a very narrow strip available to move up troops through. Uh, when you consider the uh, horrible noise of the artillery preparation which lasted for 45 minutes prior to our crossing during which time commands can't be heard and uh, it's very difficult to uh, give any orders and expect them to be carried out.
Germans had constructed a rather wide band of wire, barbed wire, on the far side of the Roar River and studded it with S mines, which uh, bounced up in the air when triggered off about six feet and exploded there, making it impossible for anybody to avoid the fragments. This minefield and barbed wire on the far side of the river made the Roar River one of the biggest little rivers in the world as far as I was concerned. Before that day was over, we had two full infantry regiments across. The Germans were caught off balance. They did counterattack us at the town of Ball, but they were unable to organize themselves fast enough. And after three days, our position on the other side of the river was secure. It was General Bowling's impression at that time that the German soldier was no longer the same soldier whom we had faced earlier. The point now was to break through all of the resistance and give the enemy no time to catch his breath or to recover even for a moment. phase of the war began for us on April the 1st when we crossed the Rhine. Everything that we had was on wheels and they were all turning. We rolled across the northern part of Germany on autobahns for the most part uh, at great speeds and long convoys. Uh, this was uh, exciting because we were covering so much ground uh, compared to what it had been like on the Siegfried line earlier and uh, we rarely uh, had to get out of the trucks except when we'd run into a, a rash of firing then we'd have to jump out and run for cover and then after a while the uh, whatever difficulty would be taken care of and then we'd roll on again. If combat can be described as as fun uh, this was because uh, uh, the weather was fine and we were rolling and we were going through uh, a part of Germany which had not been uh, much shot up uh, and we saw civilians for the first time, uh, German civilians, uh, and we were able to shout at Fräuleins and do all the things soldiers like to do. Allied morale was high, for each man of the 84th knew that the war was near its end. During the more and more frequent lulls in fighting, there was time for a little relaxing, time even for the humorous anecdote. Army rations were pretty good, but one day after too many servings of corned beef, we spotted a half-starved German chicken. One of the men went out gunning for it. He was using an M1 rifle, but he had armor-piercing bullets in it. The soup we made that night, we had to strain the bones through our teeth. I am Fritz Kramer. I was with the 84th Division as a rather elderly soldier from my 35th to my 37th year. In one respect, I have to admit, however, I probably was not a very typical and normal soldier. I did like the army food. I wanted to get lots of food. I got it. I wanted to get simple food. I got it. Very many of my Playmates uh, felt that the army food was not good, but I must uh, say in this connection that I have found in life that the people who went traveling complain that the oysters are never fresh enough and the champagne never cold enough are generally people who at home had neither champagne nor oysters. There was one fellow that we had who was really uh, uh, sharp at gathering eggs. He knew where they all were. And he uh, 
uh, gathered a, a, a big armful of them one morning. It was very early, about five o'clock, and he was just coming around the corner of a building, and a German officer came around the other way. And they stared at each other for a second, and then he took the eggs that he had in one hand, and he threw them all, about five or six of them, right at the German officer. And the German then ran around the building the other side. And later on, the German said to us in impeccable English, he said, you know, you fellows are lousy soldiers. He said, I've been trying to surrender all night long. And he said, now finally you throw eggs at me. And here he said, I've been trying to surrender. But there were other German soldiers who found surrender less of a problem. This experience was noted by a new member of the 84th Division, Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Bowling, Jr then a rifle company commander, and a son of the commanding general. He had only recently escaped from a German prisoner of war camp. By the end of April, A Company had reached the Elbe River. And this started a short, but rather strange life for the men in the unit. Uh, the Germans had naturally withdrawn across the river to the other side, and they permitted us, strangely enough, to enjoy a degree of freedom during the daylight hours. We actually could go out into the river and fish near our banks, of course. But at nighttime, any movement along the river whatsoever drew fire. At that particular time, there was a degree of mixed emotions among the men in the company. There was that particular feeling in which they wanted to go on and be the first unit into Berlin, which had been the division objective ever since they landed in Europe. And at the same time, the soldiers, I don't believe, wanted to have the honor of being the last man, the last casualty in the war. And I must admit, the Elbe looked very wide at that time. After uh, just a few days, really, on the Elbe, uh, we awoke one morning and uh, discovered uh, much to the amazement of everybody that the far bank was uh, virtually covered with uh, tens of thousands of uh, German soldiers uh, desperately trying to get across to our side. It was quite apparent that, that there was uh, no effort, that this wasn't an attack, and as a result there was no effort on our part to uh, prevent this crossing. Uh, they were uh, trying to get across on rafts that they had made during the night and on boats, on inner tubes, any way they could get across, and they were quite successful. And this, of course, was the day when our battalion, and I guess the division, captured the largest number of prisoners. The war wasn't over, but the Germans had decided that they were going to surrender to us rather than to the Russians. One of the lasting memories for me of this last action was when General Bowling and I crossed the, the very swift Elbe River to meet the oncoming Russians. This was on the 26th of April. On the far bank of the river were at least 10,000 German soldiers who had not yet been taken prisoner. Some were wounded, others were sick, and all were thoroughly demoralized. The very sight, though, of so many men trapped there on the other side of the river symbolized for me the total collapse of the German army and the absolute conclusion of hostilities. When we finally encountered the Russians on the opposite bank of the Elbe, they appeared to be a rather motley disorganized crew with uh, all kinds of transportation, including horse-drawn wagons, ambulances, motorcycles, bicycles, and even a few riding bareback plow horses. Uh, they were a very friendly, boisterous lot who uh, seemed extremely happy to uh, meet up with the Americans and uh, finally realize that the war was at an end. For those who met at the Elbe on that April day in 1945, the war had reached its inevitable conclusion. On May 7th, the end would be made official by the formal surrender of all German forces to the Allies. The Third Reich, which Hitler had proclaimed would last a thousand years, now lay buried within the rubble of a 